Father, the power of your word is all we need. Not the power of persuasion, not the power of personality, not the power of pomp and circumstance, nor the power of money. We need the power of your word. Your word is the only thing that can change our lives. I believe that, God. I do. May the faith that you've given me to believe it be infectious. May I preach today as if it was all your Holy Spirit doing the talking. May my words be few and yours be many. And may those that are here understand the, the broken heart of a living and loving God who cares so much for the needy and the hurt. For those that are here, God, that do not know you. God, may your word melt them. May your spirit penetrate them. And may your blood save them. These things we pray by Christ's power. Amen. Amen. We looked at the life of Paul. The last of the last days of the Apostle Paul as we've gone through 2 Timothy. And if something happens in this chapter, you know, it's... To me, guys, honestly, this is one of those chapters. Every once in a while, uh, a pastor reads a chapter and he looks at it and, and, and he can inflect some kind of thought process on it. He can put some kind of personal opinion even, well, based upon this or based upon... There's no messing up this chapter. To see the broken heart of a man who's in... Now, for you guys that haven't been here, Paul's in prison. He's in prison for preaching God's word in Rome. He appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar he went. And for being a Christian, he is in prison. And he's been sentenced to death, and he's waiting for the shoes to walk down the hall. Paul, you, now. Church history tells us it was soon hereafter, and that this being about A.D. 67, about 67 years, <coughs> excuse me, after our Lord resurrected, the church history tells us that he was beheaded. He had his head cut off, as all the apostles were martyred, except John, who was boiled in oil, and they couldn't kill that guy. But that's a different story. We've looked through 2 Timothy. We talked about how he told him to hold fast. Paul speaking to young Timothy, hold fast to the words, you therefore be strong. You remember the words, remind them, charge them. The powerful words, the last dying words of a father in the faith speaking to his son in the faith. Last week, perilous times are on the way. With that thought in mind, verse 1, <coughs> chapter 4 says, I charge you, therefore. Given all the powerful... <coughs> Excuse me, guys, I'm sorry. I'm okay now. Given all the powerful words that Paul uses, he says, I charge you, therefore. Because of those things, here's what he wants. You ready? You with me? Tune in, focus up, listen this. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want your son, your daughter to do something, you say something like, you promise? Some of you might even say, you swear? Here, he, you were talking about tightening the screws? I charge you, therefore, before God and Jesus. And let me remind you, he's going to judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. Now, I don't know what that means, but it means like more. <laughs> I charge you more. Not just before God. Not just before... Yeah, I'll take one. Just in case it happens again. I got two of them now. That's good. Thank you, baby. <clears throat> Juggling was never my forte. 
<laughs> I had that cold last week. And God didn't heal me. He let me walk right through it. He will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. Well, what, what, is he, what is he trying to therefore in front of God, in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, in his kingdom? And, I mean, what are, you, what are you trying to make him promise you, Paul? I mean, imagine being Timothy, reading this letter. I charge you, therefore, uh-huh, before God, right, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you charging me, Paul, at his appearance and his kingdom? Uh, you think you're going a little overboard here? What does he charge him? Look at verse 2. Preach the word. Preach the word. Every pastor that's ever read this has at some point had to ask themselves, am I preaching the word? Am I up here preaching God's word? You know the Bible says not many of you ought to be teachers for you will receive a stricter judgment. Do you know that? I come up here daintily, walking up here I better be prepared to preach the word. Not to tell you about the latest fad, not to sell you Mona V, not to give you my personal opinion on how you should change your life, rearrange your marriage, walk like a man. No, I better be preaching the word. The word is what changes your life. If you start being a fruit inspector instead of a root changer, you've done nothing for anybody. Oh, you fighting a lot with your wife? Oh, here's what you got to do. Oh, you're having a problem with that? Here's what you should do. Listen, here's what you should do to all your problems. Read the Word. Read the Word. Oh, but my struggle, you know, they didn't have that struggle. Nonsense! The Word will change your life for the better. Tell me your problem. And then tell me about your devotional life, your prayer time. Guarantee you, I can change your life by exhorting you to read the Word. In these days of church light, church light, hey, let's be happy, okay? <laughs> Let's not talk about blood. Blood is depressing. <laughs> the cross, that's ugly. No, let's not talk about the cross, okay? Let's talk about positive energy, good vibes, a, a nice aura. This man's about to die. He's about to have his flipping head cut off. For what? For being a born-again evangelical Christian. And perilous times are coming for you too, my brothers and sisters. For as anti-Christianity travels the world over at the speed of light, creeping its way into our country, so that soon there will be a knock on our doors asking us about our hate speech. Do you believe in gay marriage? No, I don't. Hate speech. We will shut your church down. It's already happening. What do you mean? You don't believe in gay marriage? Well, I don't believe two gay people can be married. What do you mean? Well, if the state wants to proclaim them wife and wife or husband and husband, I guess they can do that. But you see, marriage ordained by God was a picture of Christ in the church, so gay people therefore can't be married. They can be together. I don't have a problem with gay people being together. I have a problem with anybody going to hell. I don't care whether they're gay or whatever. I don't want nobody to go to hell. But you want to be together, be with, you know, do your thing, you know what I mean? I don't care. But I don't believe in gay marriage. 
I don't believe that the state should ordain gay marriage. I don't believe the state should give two people of the same gender the right to be called married when that gives them a false sense of security when you cannot be married since marriage is a picture of Christ and the church according to scripture. And that's a husband and a wife. You hate gay people. No, I hate people who say I hate gay people. Does that make it any easier? <laughs> Preach the word. In season and out of season. In the original Greek, it literally means good time, not good time. Good time, not good time. When it's right and when it's wrong. Preach the word. Now isn't that funny? That's how it always winds up for us. Somebody comes in and they need the word and we're in, in not in the mood to give them the word. We're busy about work. We're doing our work thing. Now all of a sudden somebody comes across our path and they're needy, they're hurting, they're in need. But I'm not in the mood. I'm working, man. I'm trying to fix this thing here. I'm busy. My kids got to get to school. I can't. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now, I want to know how certain preachers in church light these days take this. Because here, the Apostle Paul told Timothy to rebuke. The word rebuke, if you want to circle it, next to it means muffle like dog. Like if you have dogs, like I have, I have chihuahuas. I have other dogs, so I have five dogs. But the chihuahuas, when visitors come over, they bark incessantly. <laughs> And I don't know what you expect of your pastor. Oh, hush. Shh. Come on, be quiet. That would be reproving. Shh. I don't do that. I go, shut up! Amen. That's called rebuke. The same thing the Lord Jesus did when he was on the boat and the waves, the Bible says, grew contrary. And the apostles were freaking out. It said he grabbed a hold and he looked and he rebuked. Be quiet! Be still! And the wind and the waves. It was a great calm. And they were amazed. And they said, what manner of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the picture for us is the Lord is on your boat and the wind and the waves grow contrary. What a picture. And he can rebuke them. Yes, he yells at them to shut. What does the pastor who doesn't rebuke? You guys have heard me rebuke you all before by God's word. What do they, how do they make this? How do they get this exhortation? Well, you know, Ryan, if you rebuke less people, more people would come to your church. <laughs> I, I don't care. I'm not trying to grow a big church. And you're about to see why. Continuing. 4, verse 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Oh, I heard this guy on TBN. We've got to get him for our church. Oh, what a teacher. He's this and he's that and he's dynamic and he's this. He tells great stories. You know... Church by the Glades at Vitor Belfort last week talking about anti-bullying. Maybe we should get him here. The guy that beats people up in a cage talking about anti-bullying. I love it. I should get him here. They'll heap up for themselves teachers that their itching ears want to hear for their own desires. Hmm. 
as in 2,000 years ago, he predicted what has already taken place. Am I wrong? Is the apostle wrong? You're not here to hear a good teacher. Please don't do that to me. Don't do that to yourself. No matter who is up here preaching, the leadership of this church will make sure that they will preach the word. And he, he is here every week. And we find and found and build this church on everything scripture says to the best of our ability. And if you see something that's not biblical, you bring it to our attention. You be the Berean, as the Bible says. You come and say, you know, I saw this in Scripture, and here's how you're doing things, and this is what we want to do. So you can be safe and secure, or very unsecure, insecure, and very unsafe coming here for the wrong reason. But don't worry, there's other churches you can go to if you have itching ears. You want a nice message? You can scratch your ears over there. Because I couldn't care less if you scratch your ears. Verse 4. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. <clears throat> now the next thing that happens here is poignant. Very poignant. Because he goes from almost writing scripture to reading a, a diary of sorts, personal memoirs. We get a little bit of church history. We get a little feel for what Paul... Again, I want you to understand. 2,000 years ago, when Christianity was first on the move, this, this faith was persecuted everywhere. And this man, this is real. There was a man in a prison writing to another man who is a pastor at a church. This is real. And you're about to, <clears throat> excuse me, hear his personal memoirs. Are you ready? For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The Apostle Paul was obviously a sports fan. He obviously was a fan of fights. Maybe the wrestling that they had in the Olympics back then or something. He said, he's using his analogy. I fought a good fight. I fought the fight. As a fighter fights until the end, I fought the fight. I fought the good fight. I've run the race. If you're a swimmer, a runner, he's with you. The Apostle Paul, man, he was a fan of that stuff. He used it all the time. Just like the Lord Jesus used agricultural symbolisms, so too the Apostle Paul. I fought the fight. I've run the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me, verse 8, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. And I love that. He says, this is not exclusive to me. If you're looking for his coming, you get a crown of righteousness. Now, let me tell you, I know the vast majority of you guys are thinking, crown of righteousness? Listen, <laughs> I ain't righteous. Neither was Paul. He was a man. A man who did the best he can. In some areas, his life was terrible. Just like you. He says, come on. You'll get the crown of righteousness, and it's nothing you've done to deserve it. God's going to give you that crown. Look for his appearing. Ready? Practice his presence. Have you ever heard that statement? Practice his presence. Make it like wherever you are, he's with you. I'm talking about driving in the car, guys. And some... Heavenly vision pulls up next to you. Just make believe he's in the car. Live like he's with you. Live like he's with you. Practice his presence. Verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this, ple pleasant, this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Please give me your attention. 
I'm going to die soon, son. And I want to see you before I go. Please come to me quick as you can. Demas has forsaken me. Now, Demas was one of the guys, you hear his name a couple of times in Scripture. He, <coughs> he was hanging out with him when he was in Corinth and Ephesus. And it's not like Demas became wicked. Demas wasn't a wicked liver. Demas said, wow, this just got a little too real for me. They're going to kill Paul? And here I am going to visit him, and they see that I'm one of him? When they kill Paul, they might kill me. <clears throat> Did this get a little real for you maybe soon? It's not like he loved ice cream and Cadillacs and playing golf and you know that's not what he liked you know what he liked breathing and there is a time where your faith in Christ is going to start to cost you a little bit more maybe for some of you new folk everybody's going to be talking about what they partied on this weekend when you go to work the waitresses the waiters you know people at the Water cooler. Oh, bro, you don't know what I did. Oh, my goodness. Hey, bro, what'd you do? <laughs> Went to church. What? Dude, you ain't becoming one of them, are you? Heaven, yeah. <laughs> Be bold. Apostle Paul is about to die. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he left for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Let me get a little comical right now. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he wrote the book of Matthew. I'm sorry, Luke. He wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. That consider, that's considered more than half of the New Testament. Luke's like a doctor. If you read the book of Acts, it's detailed. Okay? And he's saying, everybody's forsaken me. And then he goes, only Luke's with me. Do you know what it's like being around Luke? He never stops writing. Doesn't talk much, but he writes a lot. Only Luke is with me, all right? Please visit me. <laughs> Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me in ministry. There's something so precious there. If you keep your place here and turn to Acts chapter 15, such an amazing lesson to be learned here for all of us. Acts chapter 15. Look at verse 36. Acts 15.36 Say amen when you're there so I know. Amen. Are you there? Look at this. Then after some time, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us know, now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. Please give me your attention real quick. Let me give you background. If you're new to scripture, the cool thing about reading the epistles, especially the epistles of Paul, is you can correlate them in the book of Acts. Wow, that's when Paul was going through Galatia. That's when Paul was going through Ephesus. That's when Paul was going through Thessalonica. And then you correlate it with the books that he wrote to those churches after he left. He wrote this letter that we're reading right now to Timothy, who is the pastor in Ephesus and now we can oh you can actually it's kind of a cool thing to see what was going on so he he tells he tells his his son in the faith hey bring Mark with you but I want you to see what happened with Mark here again after some days Paul said to Barnabas Barnabas the word Barnabas means encourager that was Paul's constant companion Barnabas was the first guy when Paul was young in the Lord if you go back to Acts chapter 9 10 11 you'll see when Paul got converted if, again, if you're new to Scripture, this is all very interesting stuff. It starts to make Scripture smaller and smaller and smaller. Because sometimes you crack this book open and you're like, man, there's 3,000 pages and I don't know what to look at next. And you look at it and you're like, man, I'm totally lost. Now all of a sudden it starts to look a little bit smaller. And now you start to grasp it. Just, just get your, your hand around it. You know, oh, I got it. You with me? 
Barnabas was his first friend. Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take him take with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia. Now you'll see the story in Pamphylia where Mark didn't feel like he wanted to go. So they went down to the dock ready to get on the boat and Mark said, I ain't going. He's like, what? I ain't going. Wait a second. We planned this whole trip around you. I ain't going. Fine. Now, later on, in the section we're reading, they're planning another trip. Hey, let's go back now to every place that we've preached the Word of God, and let's make sure. And here comes Barnabas, and who does he have with him? He's got Mark with him. He goes, you, you ain't bringing that guy. You, there ain't no quitters on our team. You ain't bringing a quitter. Now, I love this because there's a reality here. We think if you're Christians, there's no arguments. There's no discussions. You don't get upset. You don't, you know, everybody should live in harmony and nice. Yeah, everybody should, but everybody don't. <laughs> Do they? No, I mean, except you guys, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> and had not gone with them to the work. Verse 39, Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria, Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Back to 2 Timothy. Guys, when you're at the end of your life, you realize... The old contentions don't mean anything anymore. You know, I used to hate this dude, but I used to not like this guy, this girl. You know, this one did this, this one. Paul, at the end of his life, he, he's letting it go. Bring Mark. Mark, that's the guy to quit. Listen, the grace of God covers me, man. The grace of God will cover him. When you're hurting, when there's nothing left of your life, when you are, you ready for the word, guys? Broken. When you're broken, pride makes you whole with the world. The brokenness that God has done, you just, I remember just hating everybody for so long, just being, just having so many people on my back weighing me down, mad at this one and mad at that one, and that one did this and this one did that. And, and after God broke me, it was like, I don't care anymore. Well, you know, that guy tried to have you killed. I don't care. I just don't care anymore. I'm, I'm broken. There's nothing. When you've done something against somebody who is so special, it's wrong. But I'm not special. I'm special in God's eyes. And God gave me grace. I gotta give it to others now. I gotta. Do you understand the brokenness? Paul's about to die. And even in ministry, even his, his, his arguments in ministry just don't mean nothing anymore. Just let it go. Who did you wrong? What did they do? Let it go. Let it go. Oh, but they molested me. But they... Listen. You're made whole by the blood of Christ. Let it go. Oh, but they robbed me. Let it go. It's not doing nothing for you anymore. It's killing you. You hear him? Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for ministry. Verse 12, and Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas, and when you come in the books, especially the parchments. Listen to me. Why don't I want a big church? This is the Apostle Paul, the first missionary. He gave his life and his death for the ministry. He should not be alone in a prison without a coat to keep him warm. This is not happening in our day and age. Pastors are retiring. Oh, and they got it made. Oh, the church bought him a big house. And they got a nice pension. What? This is the Apostle Paul. And he's got nothing. Can you bring me a coat? It's cold in this friggin' cell. I got nothing. 
my books, man. It's my precious books. Parchments, especially my parchments, man. He's so alone. This isn't fair. This doesn't abode well in my heart. It doesn't sit right with me. Oh, but let's have an American faith, okay? Hey, you know what? Go, Lee, go, go, let's get a latte machine. When I read this, I feel dirty. You know what it makes me feel, guys? You ready? It makes me feel grateful. Not self-defeating, not, man, I'm, no, I go, God, why have you chosen me to be so blessed? We have air conditioning and lighting. We have a giant church, giant church. For you that don't come from Calvary, Fort Lauderdale, or Pompano First Baptist, this is a giant church, man. This is big. Pastors come in here, real pastors come in, they go, hallelujah. Oh, look what the Lord has done. Black ceiling tile. I ain't, I ain't kidding. You read this, the Apostle Paul, the man whose message I'm preaching, I'm living off of what he started. And he's, bring me a coat and a book to read, please. Everybody's left me. Everybody's gone. I'm alone. Nobody's left. Oh, but God's with the big churches, right? Because the Word of God's going forth, and we know that success means having a giant church. Because that's somewhere in Scripture. Nowhere in Scripture. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. It's a man named Alexander the coppersmith, and apparently he had a habit. You know what he did? He went from church to church to church, and he was a coppersmith. And I think he, he extended that. He was like, like a musician or a, a carpenter or somebody who went from church to church, and he immediately offered his services to the church, to the pastor, and they, he was endeared immediately. But Paul said, watch that guy. He's a son of a gun. He will hurt you. And it happens every day in our church. Listen, we've had people come and go, and they come here and they bring their talent, and they just say, hey, make me the worship leader, or make me the head. And, and we, by the grace of God, quote unquote, or should I say the grace of man, we put them in position, and they hurt us, and we call the, the, the church that going and say, listen, be careful with that dude, okay? Oh, we, we know better. We'll get, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do something that you didn't do. And he hurts more people there. And then he goes to the next church and hurts more people there. And he goes to the next church and hurts more people there. He or she. Here, the Apostle Paul wasn't gossiping. He was saying, listen, the guy Alexander the Coppersmith, he's dangerous. Watch out. And then something underlined in every pastor's Bible, may the Lord repay him for his works. <laughs> totally separate though. You must also beware of him, verse 15, for he has greatly resisted our words. Verse 16, at my defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me, may it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. Listen, let me explain to you what happened. And we don't have time, but you can look up Acts 24 through 26 at home. Paul goes before the king and there's nobody, nobody. If they came in here and arrested me, how many of you guys are going to show up to my court case if they knew if you show up for him, you might be arrested too? Listen, this became very real to me and my wife. We, you know, we adopted Cammie, and then, and then we, we, got, we fostered her sister, Kiki, and we're looking to adopt her, and, and the state didn't want us to. The state looking to do somebody a favor was trying to give the kid back. There was that whole color thing that they went through. They, they did this whole thing to us. And all of a sudden, this lady said, hey, we'll have your kids removed. It was like a smack in the face. What? They're going to bring a charge against us for child abuse. We'd lose our own kids. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're just looking to be false. We're just trying to do a good deed. We don't want this to get, that's a little bit too real. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? 
This just got real for us. I don't mean like real like is in finances. I, I mean like you will be charged with child abuse, you will lose your kids, and you will have to go to court. For what? Sorry about the spit. <laughs> For what? For taking care of somebody else's kid? No. For not following the system. I'm not letting you put that kid back with that mother. Her whole family's called us and told us she's still on crack, she's still prostituting herself, and this kid is perfect and we're not going to let you ruin her. Don't interfere. This is the way the system works. The system don't work like that in our house. We'll charge you with child abuse. Interfering. What? And how many are you going to show up? They look, oh, you with him? Are you with that guy? You with him? Okay. They're out there taking, taking names, writing down plates. You say that now, but let me tell you, it caused me and my wife to pause for a minute. Whew, maybe, maybe, whew. This just got real. No joke, this got real. And this is exactly where the apostle's at, man. Verse 16 again, at my first defense, no one stood with me. The Apostle Paul, there they are, in court, standing before the king, Felix and Festus. Who will speak for the Apostle Paul? <laughs> Wait a second. When you brought your kid to me, and he would say, when, you, when your marriage was... Where's everybody? Say something, Luke. <laughs> Again, verse 17, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now listen, it sounds figurative, right? It's not. It's not. They were about to throw him in the Colosseum to get eaten by lions. What? Could you imagine that? You Christian? Sorry, young man. Where are you going him? Um, the lion's den. Why? Because he's a Christian. And they charge, and now that's it. Wait a second, guys, we're not reading like a make-believe story here. Do you understand this? We're reading a history book. We're reading Paul's personal memoirs. Talk about too real. Yes, God delivered me from the lion. Yes, yes, he delivered them from the lion's mouth. Has God ever delivered you from something? Yes. What did he deliver you from? The tax man? The electric company? Your stupid, wicked, foul ex-husband? God delivered him from the lion's mouth. Wow. This is just... And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Wrong! He didn't preserve you, Paul. He didn't answer your prayers. He didn't listen to you. Things didn't go the way you thought. They cut your head off. Ha, ah, you were wrong. It's okay. One way. To live is Christ, to die is gain, Paul wrote. To live is Christ, to die is gain. This is what he wrote. And then he says, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Greet Pisca, Prisca and Aquila, the house of Olenciferus. He, You guys remember um, Priscilla and Aquila? Actually, that was, Prisca was short for Priscilla. Uh, Prisca and Aquila, the house, he's talking about all the people he met through, going through Corinth and Ephesus that, that, that are now helping him in the churches. He says, send them my love. Thank, tell Onesiphorus, thanks so much. Erastus is, is in Corinth. Tro, Trophitus. Look at this now. Look in the end of verse 19. Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. There was a city named Miletus, and apparently one of the people that were with him was an, a man named Trophimus, or Trophimus, whatever. He says, I left him there sick. Wait a second. You're the Apostle Paul. Why don't you just wave your handkerchief and heal him? 
because that's not the way it worked. It didn't work that way then, and it doesn't work that way now. God heals whom God wills to heal. So then why do we pray? Because you never know when God's going to do a miracle. It was better for Trophimus, for tri Trophimus to be sick in Miletus for whatever reason. Is that okay? Or is God only God when he's got a clause? Jesus clause, whatever you want to put it in. Where he gives you what you want when you want it. No. God wills. Do your utmost to come to me before winter because it's cold in this pit and I need those things. You believe this? You you blue, you bliss, you bliss greets you. You know, I've read this thing like 8,000 times and why I'm screwing the name up now is <laughs> Eubulus greets you as well as Putin's Linus rounding out the names that you won't be naming your child, right? <laughs> you all do that. You look through the Bible looking for something to name your kid. I want you to bring your kid. I've never done a, a dedication for a Eubulus. <laughs> this is Putin's. I want you to see Putin's. <laughs> Linus, man, you see, this, this is where, uh, isn't that the kid with the blanket? <laughs> Claudia, all the brethren. Now, Claudia is a cool name, right? So weird. It's like, yeah, you got it. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen. Hey, not the most evangelical message, right? Come to the Lord and maybe you get your head cut off. Maybe they'll charge you with... Uh... But I will... You can close your Bible. Let me give you my best pitch, okay? Leah, you want to come up and play something? Let me give you my best pitch because let me tell you, I have purpose in my life. If you are without purpose, if you are lonely, and if you are cold and you are tired, but you don't have the peace of God which surpasses understanding, I will give you the opportunity to accept Christ as your Savior. To say, yes, Jesus, I need you. Yes, Jesus. All those things that that guy Paul went through doesn't sound like fun, but I'd rather go through them with you than live in a big mansion without you. If you're ready for that, if you're ready for a life of true joy, that the inside of you just... Look, you look at the outside of me sometimes and there's, there's you know... But the inside, there's true joy. I know that I am doing exactly what God's called me to do. I know it. And if you're not sure of that, I'm going to give you the opportunity. When Leah starts playing, the Christians that are around the room, pray for those that don't know Christ here. That they would, something would, just, it's my time. It's my time. It's your time to accept Christ as your Savior. Take a minute, think about these things. If you've been waiting, I, and, and I just had this sense, and I hope it's the Holy Spirit, that there's somebody in here that's been waiting for this for like a really long time a really long time and they've often wondered how to do it we're going to tell you exactly according to the word of God how it gets done so think about the things that we talked about and think about your life for a minute
the blood of many great men and women. But your entrance into the door of light of heaven has been opened by the blood of a king. And his father willingly gave him, the Lord Jesus, as a bridge between what is not holy to what is holy. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we could be called the children of God, to them who called upon him. People say all the time, well, everybody's the child of God. No, everybody's the creation of God. But you must call upon him. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from this world, from your own desires, and from the pit of hell of which without Christ you are heading. And you know it. I can lead you in a prayer that will, let me explain to you what it's like. You ever hear a song and you hear that song, you say, yes, yes, that's how I'm feeling. Somebody just sang a song, how I'm feeling. Well, I'm going to pray a prayer that you will say as you're praying it, yes, yes, that's it. That's what I've needed. If I'm speaking to you or if I'm speaking about you, Stand to your feet and be ready to say this prayer with me. Jesus. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Congratulations. And you, sister. God bless you. Congratulations. Don't stand unless you mean it. It's got to be something sincere. Don't do it because of my impassioned cry. Do it for the yearning of your heart. Do it because it's serious. It's what you really, really know you need to do. accepted him as your savior and 
you want to rededicate your life just just to make just make it good you've had some junk going on in your life and your heart's been wrong man don't be afraid just to rededicate don't be afraid to just I don't care who sees I don't care who knows I got to redo this thing man I just want to confirm the call you too far from God the Bible declares it we all have fallen short of the glory of God don't be afraid to tell him you love him in the presence of others look he hung on a cross naked and beaten dying in public for you and, and you're afraid to stand up just in case somebody might get the wrong idea. Just make it sincere. I'm not trying to get you to stand up. I just want you who are not standing up, who know you need to be standing up. I'm not trying to get you to stand for Christ in my impassioned cry. I'm trying to get you to do what you know you want to do. standing repeat this prayer out loud after me and more important again make it your words not mine say out loud dear God I'm ready this time I'm staying in your light in your love and in your word by your, power, by your power, bring me to heaven. Bring me to heaven. By, your power, by your power, keep me strong on earth. May I be called a Christian and never be ashamed again. Whether it's work or school, give me strength. I mean it. This time I'm yours. Forever and ever and ever in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. If you have questions, our leadership team will be up here. If you want to get started on your on your uh, Bible study, prayer time, whatever it is, we have Guys that ladies and guys that'll answer your questions. If you just need some time, we'll be back here on Wednesday. Call this your home church and, and, and we'll make you as comfortable, as warm as we can. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Have the great rest of your weekend.